so happy we alive. Good evening. Welcome to Global Late Night. This evening, we're in the lovely Clifton Center in the uh, Crescent Hill neighborhood. And uh, this evening, we're here as a uh, kind of uh, relish of uh, America. The spirit of America is still alive. And that uh, one thing we do in America is we look at things from many different views. And this evening, we have a wonderful person, Amy Goodman, who has uh, been leading the charge on giving a full perspective of what's happening in the world. She's a uh, true leader, a wonderful person, and we can't hear her wait to hear what she says. So get ready for Amy Goodman. He is near death. He has been in prison since last June without charge. He has most recently been in a hunger strike. We'll do more on this piece. We're going to be broadcasting here um, from Louisville tomorrow morning, Democracy Now!, but we will give an update on his situation. This is a country that makes a great deal of difference that we should all know about. We need a media that reflects what is going on. We need a media that lets us know what is being done in our name by our government in other parts of the world. But I wanna, I wanna end with the story of Timor, which I wish I never had to repeat again. But it once again has become extremely relevant with a tsunami that struck on December 26th that natural catastrophe that wiped out this whole region, particularly hardest hit was Aceh in Indonesia. Before December 26, if you heard Aceh, you probably say, God bless you. But then we heard there's this place in Indonesia that hundreds of thousands of people died. And the media did the right thing in that case. They raced off to Sri Lanka, to Thailand, to Indonesia, to let us see what had taken place. And it proves, once again, that when you see when well, the media does the right thing, sheds that media spotlight when, when it matters. It doesn't matter if the orphan children or the mothers or the fathers were black or red or yellow or white or brown. It doesn't matter. What we see is a human being suffering. And the whole world responded. Incredible outpouring of support. Which is why it's so important we have a media that lets us see these things. What the media, though, didn't show us is that Aceh has been hit by two tsunamis, that natural catastrophe and the other tsunami that is man-made, and it is the Indonesian military. It is brutal, and it continued to kill survivors after December 26. It's declared that whole area a state of siege. It's been like that for a number of years as they try to dominate this area with Exxon Mobil there, running one of the largest gas fields in the world, very, working very closely with the Indonesian military. In fact, a whole group of human rights groups has now called for transparency. Is Exxon Mobil paying the Indonesian military uh, to work in that area? But the Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz went to Aceh soon after the tsunami. He used to be the US ambassador to Indonesia. He was there through a lot of the killing that took place in Timor when Indonesia occupied East Timor. And he came back and restored military training aid to the Indonesian military. It had been cut off in 1999 when the people of East Timor voted for their freedom in a UN-sponsored referendum, and the Indonesian military burned East Timor to the ground. And here Wolfowitz comes back, he uses this as a pretext to restore the military aid and the relationships with the US military and the Indonesian military. Now he's the main president of the World Bank. You wonder if his definition of development is taking countries' monies and pouring them into repressive regimes. It matters. I know well the brutality of the Indonesian military having survived a massacre in Timor in 1991. Just a thumbnail history of Timor. Small country, 300 miles above Australia. The Indonesian military invaded in 1975. The day before the invasion, President Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger went to 
Indonesia, Jakarta, the capital, met with Suharto, the long-reigning dictator, gave the go-ahead for the invasion. 90% of the weapons used were from the United States. December 7, 1975, Indonesia, invaded by land, by air, and by sea, closed the country off to the outside world, and for the next two decades, engaged in one of the great slaughters of the late 20th century, engaged in genocide in Timor. I got a chance to go to Timor in 1990 and 1991. 91, November 12th, I was there with my colleague Alan Nair. He was writing a piece for the New Yorker magazine. I was doing a documentary for Pacifica Radio. There was a mass in the morning at the Catholic Church in Dili, the capital of East Timor. Thousands of people came out to remember yet again another young man gunned down by the Indonesian military. The mass was so large they had to hold it outside rather than in the church. And then the people marched from the church, it was about 8 o'clock in the morning, to the cemetery. They marched through the streets of Dili, this geography of pain. Thousands more people joined. It was a cross-section of Timorese society. Old women in their traditional Timorese garb, girls in their Catholic school uniforms, boys in their school shorts, and they marched through the streets peacefully. We were interviewing people, why are you doing this? This is a land where there's no freedom of speech, no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly. Why are you risking your lives? And the people would say, for my mother, for my father, for my brother, for my village that was wiped out. And they marched that way in the boldest act of civil disobedience the Indonesian military had ever seen. When they got to the cemetery, they were exhilarated but terrified as they saw the Indonesian military march up, 12 to 15 abreast, hundreds of them carrying their USM-16s at the ready position. Now, Alan and I knew that the military had committed many massacres in the past. We decided to walk to the front of the crowd because they would never done it in front of Western journalists. And we thought, just by our presence, maybe we could head off this attack. We had always hidden our equipment because we didn't want to endanger the Timorese caught talking to journalists. This time, we took it out, and I slung my tape recorder over my shoulder, and I held up my microphone like a flag. I put on my headphones. Alan put the camera above his head and walked to the front of the crowd. The soldiers marched up, 12 to 15 abreast. They came around the corner without warning, without hesitation, without provocation. They swept past us and they opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. The people couldn't escape. There were walls on either side of the road. A group of soldiers threw me to the ground. They were beating me with their rifle butts in their boots. Alan got a photograph of them opening fire and then threw himself on top of me to protect me. And then they took their USM-16s like baseball bats and they slung them against the skull until they fractured it. We were lying on the road. Alan was covered in blood. They were killing everyone around us. And then a group of them put the guns to our heads and they were screaming two things. Politik and Australia. Politik, they were saying that for us to witness this was political. But that is our job as journalists to go to where the silence is, to bear witness. And they were shouting Australia. They were demanding to know if we were from Australia. We knew what that meant. 17 years before, when Indonesia first invaded Timor, there were six Australian-based journalists covering the invasion. They immediately executed five of them. The sixth was Roger East. He was reporting for the world from a radio station in Dili. Radio stations are so important Oppressive regimes understand this well as the most important form of mass communication. Whether it's in Mexico with the Zapatistas, or in Haiti that plays musique engagée, you know, engaged music, the regime goes in and they ransack the radio stations. And here they dragged Roger Beast out of the radio station as he showered them from Australia. They shot him into the harbor with so many thousands of Timorese in those first days after the invasion. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We believe because years later, Australia and Indonesia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing up Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. So 17 years later, November 1291, as we lay on the ground, down on the 